Okay, guys. I want to uh, I want to start talking about the other uh, trig functions, uh, secant, cosecant, cotangent, and tangent. Um, and then once we've got a good grasp of what all six of these look like, we'll spend maybe a day transforming all six of them. Okay. Um, the the idea though is if you know what the sine and cosine look like, and we should hopefully. Okay. Uh, we spent a day on that. Now, I know spending a day on something, you know, I don't have enough time. Well, it is in a college course, okay? Uh, because in a college course, you might be done in a chapter in three class periods, okay? Uh, so, we should be maybe taking this stuff home, looking at what the sine curve looks like, working with that quite a bit, working with the cosine. Even if we don't have homework, we should be going home and doing those types of things, right? Okay, so the sine curve looks like this guy here, right? Okay. And the cosine then is that moved pi or two units to the left. So we've got that relationship. Okay. Now I want to come up with what the tangent looks like. Okay. Now the tangent function, the tangent function, how do you write tangent in terms of sine and cosine? Sine over cosine, right? So let me let me try something here. Let's take uh, let's just put a slider in here. Call it a. Let's go between <coughs> negative three pi to three pi, and let's go by increments of pi over twelve. So it's going to put a point every pi over twelve units. Okay, so this, that, that slider is just oscillating, that's negative 3 pi, and each time it changes, it's changing by pi over 12. Uh, let's do this now, let's just say we have a line x equals a. Well, this is a, so that line x equals a is going to be that thing right there, right? So what I'm going to do, so if, let's just assume that we're at pi over 2, okay? That line then is going to tell me two y values, right? The y value for the orange curve and the y value for the blue curve, right? If I do the blue y value divided by the orange y value, won't that give me the tangent value at pi over 2? All right, so then it should show up somewhere on that black line. So let me just kind of grab, let's put a point on here. Let's say that we're taking, this is how I would do this. I'm going to go, I want the x value to be whatever a is. So pi over 2, pi, 2 pi, whatever the, the increment is here that I slide through. But now I want the sine of a divided by the cosine of a as the y value. Does that make sense? So that is effectively tangent. And when I plot that, we'll talk about why it's not showing up there here in a moment, but right there, you start to get that point. So right there uh, is the tangent of essentially 1.31, which I believe is uh, like 11 pi over 12. Does that make sense? Okay, um, let's go back, let's just start this slider at zero, okay, and as I move, so now what it's doing to get that point A right there, it's taking the sine value of the orange curve, which is one at that spot, right, and divided by the cosine value at that point of zero, which is zero, right, okay, um, so sine divided by cosine, and we're going to see this here in a moment, um, provides us, uh, I'm sorry, sine, yeah, sine of, so the blue curve is sine, so that's y value is zero, okay? The cosine curve is this one, it's y value is one. When I divide those, what do I get? Zero. So that's what I'm saying, the tangent at a radian of zero is plotted at zero. So zero comma zero, that, a, that point A is the tangent for zero. Does that make sense? If I go to, I'm just going to click this thing to trace. Let's skip that. So that's pi or 12. Let's go to this one. Where my cursor line is right now, that is at pi over six. Okay. The sine value at pi over six, which is that on that blue curve, would be one half. The cosine of pi over six 
is root 3 over 2, right? So right now we have 1 over root 3, which is root 3 over 3, which is about 1.7 divided by 3, which I think turns out to be about 0.55-ish, okay, in that ballpark. Um, and that's where that point A's Y value currently resides. Does that make sense? And we're going to do the same thing then for, so that's pi over 6. Let's go to one more increment of 12. We'll look at pi over 4, right? Well, look at the sine and cosine values at pi over 4. Aren't they both radical 2 over 2? What do I get when I divide this? I get 1, right? So that's why that A value is residing at a height of 1. For the tangent at pi over 4, you have a radical 2 over 2 divided by radical 2 over 2, which just evaluates as 1. Um, now, the one thing that I want to make sure we understand, okay, is that when we get out here to pi over 2 eventually, what's the y value, or what's the sine value at pi over 2? 1. What's the cosine at pi over 2? 0. What's 1 divided by 0? Undefined. So this line right there, that's why A disappears. That line right there is A. That's an asymptote. Okay? When we have division by 0 for these functions, we get asymptotes. All right, so I'm going to keep continuing the process past pi or 2. So I'm now in the second quadrant of the unit circle, taking the y values divided by the x values and plotting them against these radians. And I get that. Another asymptote right there at 3 pi over 2, right? Okay. And I can keep doing this. Another asymptote out there at 3 pi. Okay. And what's nice is that I can go this direction as well. So now I'd be rotating around the unit circle clockwise. Oops. Clockwise. And I get those points of so asymptote at negative pi over 2, which is 10 to 3 pi over 2, right? It's coterminal. Negative 3 pi over 2 is the same as the asymptote at pi over 2. I can keep going on and on. Okay? What I want you to understand is that if I know what the sine and cosine curve looks like, if I know what the blue and orange curves up there look like, and I know a key set of points off of those, I should be able to develop the tangent function pretty efficiently. Okay? I'm not going to, just like the sine and cosine, obviously, I don't want you when you're graphing the sine and cosine curves to graph all, I don't know, 16 or 17 points off the unit circle, right? Okay? That's too much. If I want to graph this curve right here, tangent of x, okay, I want you to graph the following points. Let me hide these two things real quick, okay? The first point I want you to recognize is that 0, 0 is pretty useful. Okay. The next one, because of how the sine and cosine relate to one another, is going to be pi over 4. Because at pi over 4, the sine and cosine are the same number, right? So they have a quotient of 1. Over here, okay, where am I going to have a quotient of negative 1? Negative pi over 4. And the reason it's a negative 1 is because at negative pi over 4, you're in the fourth quadrant, right? So your cosine is positive, but your sine is negative. So then it's negative, uh, positive, gives me a negative. Okay? Those three points, would you agree with those three points are on that curve? Okay? Were those three points pretty easy to graph? Yeah, a y value of 0, 1, or negative 1. There's no ambiguity there. It's pretty simple for us to find out its position. Okay? The next thing I want you to do is know that pi over 2, because cosine is 0, you have an asymptote. So you'll graph that asymptote. Okay? If I go the other direction, negative pi over 2, I should have another asymptote. Okay? So what I want you guys to be able to graph are those five things, three points and two asymptotes, right? Okay. If you can graph those, then you put a smooth curve between those.
okay, you have then effectively created one period of the tangent function. Does that make sense? And now all you're going to do is you're going to cut, lift that thing out, shift it over, paste it back down, and you get another period. Okay? So think about this. What's the, what's the period between these two asymptotes? It's pi, right? So my next asymptote, my next asymptote is going to be at, if I start here, where's my next asymptote going to be? 3 pi or 2, okay? So what I want you guys to see real quick, see if we can do this. Every asymptote for the tangent function is found as the line x equals, you start at pi or 2 with your first one. We're then going to add pi times k, where k I go negative, I don't know, ten to ten. It's actually the infinite values, but I want k to be just an integer. So my increments are going to be one. So now if I go through here and let's just say I'm going to trace that line, those are the asymptotes that I'm going to create. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Um, if you can do that, then look at the symmetry that exists inside one period. Then it halfway inside this period, you cross the x-axis. So where am I going to cross the x-axis here? That pi, right? So pi comma zero. Now, there should have been some symmetry if I look at the region between 0 and pi over 2, is there some symmetry there? Or maybe it's not symmetry. I, I, you can view it a little bit that way. But halfway in between there, don't I hit my point of C, which is at a height of what? 1. Okay. So does it make sense that halfway in between here, I'm going to reach a height of 1? Okay. So halfway in between there would be, so that's pi, that's 3 pi of 2, what's halfway in between there? Think about your unit circle. I'm in the third quadrant, right? Pi and 3 pi of 2 determine that third quadrant. What's the halfway mark? 5 pi over 4, right? Okay, so if I have 5 pi over 4, comma, 1, should be that point right there. Okay? If I look between negative pi over 2, less than x is less than 0. Now let's look at that little region of that first uh, period. Halfway in between there, don't I reach that point D? All right, so that should be analogous to this little interval right here. Okay, so pi over 2 and pi, that's the second quadrant. What's halfway mark in the second quadrant? 3 pi over 4, right? So 3 pi over 4, I'm at negative 1. And now think about that. 3 pi over 4, what's the sine value for 3 pi over 4? You guys told me you guys all got hundreds on that. Yeah, the, the, so the sine value of 3 pi over 4 is radical 2 over 2, right? The cosine is negative radical 2 over 2. So when I divide those, I get negative 1, right? And that's why that g point is at a height of negative 1. All right, so you guys proved to me, okay, that you can do the unit circle, okay? You did very well on that over the last 10, 12 years. This group, first and second period, have performed the best on that, that, that quiz, okay? Now, does that tell me that you, have, you can know it and, and retain it and reuse it? I don't know, okay? Um, it shows me you can develop it, but now the, the idea is, when Mr. Say, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Fay, Mr. Fay says, what is the sine of 3 pi over 4, you can, you can blurt that out as fast as I can say. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Because we can't just, we, as much as we're going to use these key points, we can't just sit here and wait and wait and wait and wait and then me give you the answer because nobody's learning that way. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, but if I keep doing this process, Okay, now, so 3 pi over 2, 2 pi, that would be in the fourth quarter, right? Start dividing the y value and the x value uh, for our order pairs on the unit circle in the fourth quadrant. You will start to 
reproduce point G, be right there. Point E will correspond to right there. And then point F will correspond to right there. Does that make sense? And we can keep cutting and pasting this thing, and we'll see that the tangent function is indeed that curve. Okay. Now, if you're on your TIA 3 or 84, guys, um, something to think about. I was able to get mine back working, but it's now the TIA 84 plus C Silver Edition. So, um, which is actually the better calculator, but there's some things here that I don't really like about it. Um, but if I was just going to type in the tangent function on this calculator, and let's just pay attention to the mode here. My, I'm going to go down to the mode just to prove a point here and change it to degrees. And when I graph it, that's the graph it gives me. Okay. Um, now it looks like it's slowly increased. I'm not. I'm not sure what's going on there. I, I would. I would venture to say. Let's try this. Let's then. Let's go. So so negative pi over two would be negative one eighty, right? X maximum of let's go one eighty. And let's go X scale to be forty five. And let's see what happens here. Graphic. All right. So you heard me in the past say uh, I wasn't sure what the calculator was doing when you were in degree mode. Because, because the way our window is set up, when I'm in degree mode, it's saying every mark on the x-axis then is one degree. So every time you do that on the sine, cosine, tangent, secant, cosecant, cotangent, all those curves, you're zoomed in with the standard view from negative 10 degrees to positive 10 degrees. Well, when that happens, you're going to get a, a pretty linear looking curve. You're zoomed in on a very, 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 very small portion of that curve, so it's going to look linear. Okay? If I want to do it in degrees, then I've got to adjust my window. Does that make sense? Okay? Um, if I'm in radians, now think about this. If I'm in radians, so let's go mode, radian, graph that. Now, it's the same concept. Now I'm, I'm between negative 180 radians to 180 radians, or something like that. Um, and, and that starts to fill in kind of silly looking, right? Okay, and I'm not getting the graph that I think I need. And it's all because of your window. Okay. Um, so if I'm in radians, I guess the the normal window, kind of the base window to look at is 2 pi, negative 2 pi, to positive 2 pi, uh, and then whether, I like to put a scale in here of like pi over 12, okay, because that will, uh, we've been using pi over 6, pi over 3, pi over 4, right? Okay, well pi over 4 is not a common denominator with six and it doesn't have a common factor of six and three, right? But twelve is a common factor for six, three, and four, right? So put power twelve as my scale, it should get all of those power six, power three, power fours. And now you see the tangent curve on that calculator a little bit more uh, what we're looking for, right? Okay, in, in regards to the scale of it. Um, <coughs> So that's how maybe you approach it on those calculators. Uh, let's see here. Something to think about, and I, I typed it as the equation to get these asymptotes, but a common question uh, that is asked a lot of times is what are or what is an equation for the tangent function's asymptotes? And we see that the first one there, Okay, so this, these are all my asymptotes, right? The first one starts right there at pi over 2. So that's what we start with. We say pi over 2 plus then to get to the next one, which is this one, I just add pi to it, right? And then to get that one, I would add pi again, right? And then to get that one, I would just add pi again, right? So if I want this one out here, it's pi over 2 plus 3 pi's, right? If I want this one, it's pi over 2 plus 2 pi's. 
If I wanted this one, it's pi or 2 plus 1 pi. If I wanted this one, it's pi or 2 minus 1 pi. Pi or 2 minus 2 pi. Does that make sense? So I'm adding some multiple of pi, and that's where this k came up or came from, um, and we're going to say k is an element of your integers, okay? Meaning k could be 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, but it can't be like a half or something like that. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's going to be a formula that generates all your asymptotes for the tangent function. Is that something you need to memorize? I don't know. Okay. My principle is no. I, I should be able to develop, because I know what sine and cosine looks like, I should be able to develop that first uh, period of the tangent from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, cut and paste that thing, find where another asymptote is, and then sit down and write that equation for where, how I find those asymptotes. Okay. And I think that's because you've already got that information trained into you, you don't have to memorize anything there, right? It's, it's work, but I think you do that two, three, four, five times, then it will be kind of drilled into you that that formula is what it is. Okay? Um, all right, so that's the tangent. So that's great. Um, let's talk. We did this kind of backwards in the last class. But let's deal with uh, the reciprocal of tangent. What, are, what is the reciprocal of tangent? Cotangent, okay? So I'm just going to graph the tangent right now from tangent of x. I'm going to go from negative pi over 2 to, let's just go... Uh, 3 pi over 2. All right, so I just want to look at that right there, okay? Now, there are some key points on there, right? We grabbed some really nice points. Uh, we had negative pi over 4, comma, negative 1. We had 0, 0. We had pi over 4, comma, 1, okay? Obviously, I had our asymptotes at pi over 2. Um, so I'll put that in. So it's it's going to be critical here in a moment. Uh, we had uh, 3 pi over 4 negative 1, pi 0, and what's the next one? 5 pi over 4, comma 1. Okay, so those are the, the points that I want to look at to help us develop the tangent function. If I have those points, so let's just say, let's look at point um, C. Okay, so point C right there, okay, is the point pi over 4, comma 1, right? Okay. Well, when I deal with that, and I, so that's, the, that's from the tangent. Okay. That's from the tangent. So the cotangent is going to take that number and find its reciprocal, right? Well, what's its reciprocal? It's just 1, right? So that point should be on the tangent function, pi over, or sorry, the cotangent function, pi over 4, comma 1. Okay. Uh, let's look at B. B is one that's kind of weird. B is located at zero radian. Sine of r by cosine gives me zero, right? Okay. Now, I don't care what this denominator is here, some number, zero divided by some num some real number, but it's going to give me zero, right? So a lot of times we don't care what the number is, so we just make it one. When I find the reciprocal of zero over one, what is that? One over zero. It's undefined. So for the cotangent, does it make sense that through that point B, we're actually going to have an asymptote for the cotangent? Okay. Now, likewise, since we understand that concept, let's actually go to the tangent asymptote at pi over 2. The tangent asymptote, the reason we have an asymptote here at pi over 2 for the tangent function was because at pi over 2 for tangent, you ended up with, 1 divided by 0. That's the tangent, right? At pi over 2. Well, what's the cotangent going to look like at pi over 2? It's going to look like that, right? Does that make sense that we're going to have a point actually show up right there for the cotangent? All right. So what I want you guys to see here, and kind of a symmetry concept, um, we, we used 
I, the way I view it, we use a little bit of symmetry for coming up with the tangent function. We know that negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 are um, your asymptotes for the tangent function, right? Halfway in between, you get an x-intercept. That creates two intervals inside that, that period. In that first interval, you're going to be at negative 1. In that second interval, your y value is going to get positive 1, and that gives you those points a, b, and c. Okay? And then you can cut and paste that. Well, the cotangent... It's somewhat similar, okay, but we're going to start with an asymptote at x equals 0 and an asymptote at x equals pi, okay? You're going to have the point pi over 2 comma 0 because that was the asymptote for tangent, right? So the reciprocal actually goes to zero. Now, does that break up that period into two intervals? Okay. For the tangent, at pi over 4, you had a y value of 1, right? So for the cotangent, what's that y value turn into? Might be somewhat of a trick, trick question. It's a reciprocal of 1. 1, right? Turns, that, that y value of 1 turns into 1, stays 1. Okay. Um, and then if I go to 3 pi over 4, that y value is going to be negative 1. So you kind of see still the same type of um, symmetry occurring between those asymptotes is that halfway we get point A, we get our intercept, and that creates then two intervals inside that period. In the first interval, you're at a height of 1. In the second interval, you're at a height of negative 1. Okay? So now the tan or so the cotangent function between zero and pi looks like that. Okay. Then we can take and figure out what our asymptotes look like. Um, I think I deleted that line that was creating my asymptotes. Hopefully I did. Good. Okay. So let's say, so what is that period there? Pi, right? So where's my next asymptote going to show up over here? 2 pi. So if I just go x equals pi times k, that should produce that next asymptote, right? And if we trace that, we see all of our asymptotes are going to be generated for the cotangent of x. And we just take that first period that we created and we cut and paste it as far to the right as we need and far to the left as we need. Is that right, everybody? Okay. The tangent and cotangent are very, 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 very similar to one another. Let's look at this. Let's take, uh, so that's the cotangent. Let me get my asymptotes out of there. And this is tangent, right? Okay. See how you could take that, maybe that orange one, and let's say we reflect it. Okay, so flip the, the orange one's direction, right? Okay. Uh, and then once I flip it, so I'm looking at the point there at 2 pi where it crosses the x-axis. If I were to flip that, now all my orange ones would be going in the same direction as my blue ones, right? Could I then take those orange ones and move them over a little bit to get to the, the blue one? Okay. So let's see this. Let's, let's take that uh, orange one, which is the tangent. This is what I'm saying. And now it's going to get messy the way I'm going to have you look at this. I'm going to take the tangent, which is the orange one. And I'm going to flip it across the y-axis. And actually, it doesn't really matter. So if I do this, that doesn't matter. So you see how it flipped it? Okay, so the, I don't like the color that's given me. I don't know if I like that either. But uh, it took my tangent function, which is these, purp these dark purple ones, and it flipped it and gave me this kind of light one here, right? Does that make sense? Okay. 
Now, if I take that light one and move it, will it give me the red one? Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So I guess what I'm trying to get here, or get at here, is that if I take the tangent function, okay, if I put a negative there, it flips it, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Now, is that the same flip as if I put it here? Is it producing the same flip? Is it, is it producing the same image? Yeah, one's an x-axis reflection, one's a y-axis reflection, right? But it produces the same image. Um, so if I want to take the tangent, reflect it, and now let's say that I want to move it, let's move it pi over two units. I don't really care which way. That way. Is that the same thing? as the cotangent. Does that make sense? Okay. So those are relationships that we're gonna we're gonna hopefully recognize and use and see. Um, because often if they give me like inside an equation that has uh, you know the tangent of x plus pi over two, uh, maybe I want to rather refer to that as negative cotangent of x. Okay. Um, and I think it has to be negative there because I didn't I didn't incorporate the, the negative tangent of x um, plus pi over 2. Uh, but that's the idea, is that we should be able to develop these links of being able to rewrite one of our trig ratios in terms of the other ones to make things a little bit easier. Um, so that's the, the tangent cotangent. Now, guys, my suggestion to you, yes, we've talked about it. I'm going to record this. I'm going to post it. There are also other videos on my website and that kind of stuff. We might only talk about how they're developed one or two times, but you're going to be able. To, you're going to need to know them. Okay? Uh, we can't. We can't sit and dwell on these things for four, five, six, seven days in a row because we'll just run out of time. Okay? So we need to do some some legwork outside of class. That's kind of why last week I wasn't assigned too many homework assignments. My hope was that you went home, even though we didn't have any math homework. We 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 spent time, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes a day. Looking at what's the sine function, what's that look like? What's the cosine function? What's that look like? How do I develop those? How can I graph those quickly? Um, because with those graphs, we're going to do a lot of work. Uh, and if it takes you, you know, five, six, seven minutes to graph this sine function, then it's going to take you even longer time to graph the cosecant. Okay? Uh, so that's what I want to graph right now is the cosecant. Okay. The cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine, right? Cosecant is the reciprocal of the sine. So it's the same procedure, guys. If I were to uh, look at a radian of zero, let's just go plot the points this way. If I'm going to look at the radian of zero, right now on the sine function, it's at a y value of zero, right? What's the reciprocal of that y value of zero? I have 0, comma 0. Take the y value and find its reciprocal. How do you get 0? It's 0 divided by a real number, right? Okay. So when I take that reciprocal, it's a real number divided by 0, which turns into being undefined. Okay. So at 0 right now, I have actually a what for the uh, cosecant? I'm going to ask them to x equals 0 is going to be an asymptote for um, the cosecant. Okay? Let's go to uh, a nice value, pi over 6. What's the y value for pi over 6 for the sine function? 1 half, right? It would be that oh, pi over 6, comma, one half would be that point right there, right? Well, follow what's the reciprocal of one half? Two, right? That is a point on the cosecant. Okay. Let's go to pi over three. Pi over three on the sine is square root of three over two, right? See that point there that's not labeled, okay? Well, that reciprocal would just be 2 
divided by square root of 3, right? B point B. That's the reciprocal of um, sine at pi over 3. Pi over 2 for the sine function, what's the y value for pi over 2? 1. What's the reciprocal of 1? 1. That point right there, I'm going to make that one blue. That one is a very, 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 very important point for us. Okay? For the mere fact that it was really easy to graph in comparison to A and B, right? Now, A wasn't terrible because it was 2, but B was a pain in the butt. Okay? When I go find point D here in a moment, which is going to be where we at? 2 pi over 3. Okay? 2 pi over 3, the y value for. Uh, the unit circle is square root of 3 over 2. It would be that point right there, right? Well, reciprocal of that would be that. Okay? Which that point there then, plot that point, is that the same point as B? Is it the same Y value as B? That's because when I'm on the unit circle in the first and second quadrant, the sine value is positive, right? Well, that means the reciprocal of the sine value still has to be positive. That's why we're seeing those B's and D's kind of mimic each other. If I go to 5 pi or 6, on the unit circle, the Y value is 1 half. Okay? But then on the cosecant, the reciprocal of 1 half is 2, right? So A and E kind of replicate each other corresponding points. Now, I get to pi. What's the Y value on the unit circle of pi? Zero. Okay. Zero is found by taking zero divided by a real number, right? Find its reciprocal. Real number divided by zero ends up being undefined. So x equals pi is going to be another asymptote. Okay. Now I continue around my unit circle. Okay, that just got me in the first and second quadrant of the unit circle, right, for the cosecant. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in the third and fourth quadrant. Are the third and fourth quadrant going to be the same ordered pairs for X and Y? They're just different signs, right, FIGNs. Okay, so the Y values in the third and fourth quadrant are simply just negative, right? Okay, so when I'm looking for the cosecant here for... Uh, let's say 7 pi over 6, instead of 1 half, I'm looking at negative 1 half, right? So that reciprocal is not negative 2, or sorry, not just 2, it's negative 2. 3 pi, I'm just going to kind of expedite things here. 3 pi over 2, negative 1. We'll go out to, uh, what's the next one? So 7 pi, 11, so 11, so 11 pi over 6 be at negative 2 as well. What's going to happen at 2 pi? Asymptote. Okay. And we see then that when, and this is the, the nice thing about GeoGebra, I can actually type in CSC of X. Does that blue curve go through those points that we just listed? That make sense? Okay. Now, I'm going to show you a quick way to graph these. But notice, the maximums and minimums on the sine curve, do they turn into maximum minimums on the cosecant? Okay, so when I, when I, when I ask that question, let's, let's do this. Let's hide the cosecant real quick. When I ask this thing, so another word for maximum minimums as a group is extremum, right? If I click on the sine curve and ask for the extreme values, you see all the points that I just plotted, like I, J, L, okay? Do those points end up being parts of those blue curves? I and J are maximums and minimums of sine, but they're also then maximum minimums, the, the other maximum of the cosecant. So if it's a max on the red curve, it's a min on the blue one, right? If it's a min on the red one, it's a max on the blue one. But that relationship is nice for us because when we graph the cosecant curve, that relationship becomes critical. 
Notice where do all the asymptotes show up? Okay, at pi, and then 2 pi, and then 3 pi, and pi, and 2 pi, and 3 pi, and negative pi, and negative 2 pi, they are the what of the sine curve. Graphically, they're the, what would you say? Not minimums. They're not the smallest y values up there. That's what a minimum is. When you, cr what are you crossing? You're crossing the x-axis, right? You call, where you're crossing x-axis, those are x-intercepts or zeros or roots, right? Okay. So your asymptotes for your cosecant occur at the zeros or the x-intercepts of the sine function. Okay. If we can remember that, the task then is how do I graph a cosecant curve quickly? So let's pop this open, and I'll show you the quick way of doing this. And then if you understand how to do it with the cosine, the same principle then applies for the secant. So first thing you're going to do, if they ask you to graph y equals cosecant x, and this is no matter what, whether it's a, just the a, a straightforward cosecant or if they're going to ask you to shift it, left, right, stretch it, that kind of stuff, you would do the same process. So if I want to go y equals cosecant of x, that's what I want to graph. I'm first going to say, nope, I'm going to graph this. Because that is its reciprocal, right? And I know what the sine function looks like by heart. I've done enough. So I can go out here to 2 pi. I can cut that in half at pi. Cut that in half at pi over 2. 3 pi over 2. I've got my height of 1, height of negative 1. And I know then... So the sine function starts there, goes to there, comes back, the x-axis there, it's a minimum there, and then back to the x-axis. So that tells me those, those are, I were to connect it, okay, that's my sine function, right? And that then is the tool that's going to help you graph the cosecant because of the relationship that we said that at the x-intercepts of the sine are where your asymptotes for the cosecant exist. So I'm going to go to this x-intercept, draw an asymptote. X-intercept, draw an asymptote. X-intercept, draw an asymptote. And I do that as far as I need to, right? In either direction. Then there was a relationship that the maximums for the sine curve become minimums for the cosecant. So this is a maximum for the sine. It now became a minimum for the cosecant. Okay? Now, if you want to, you can go, because there are some other convenient values like pi over 6 at a y value of 2, right? 2 is a pretty easy one to graph. Most of the time, though, this is enough because we know how we should behave around asymptotes because there are no other x-intercepts, right? For the cosecant, it has no x-intercepts. So when I move to the left, I only got one option. I can't go down, right? Got to go up. Follow that asymptote. Follow that asymptote. Come over here. That point is a minimum for the uh, sine curve, so the maximum for the cosecant, follow to the left, follow to the left, or sorry, to the right. And now that is one period, then, of your cosecant. No, on the quiz, so, so like sine, uh, sine, cosine. Just for an interruption, this time, all members of the girls' softball team, please report to the lobby. Again, all members of the girls' softball team, please report to the lobby this time. Thank you. All right, so sine and cosine, I want those points to have the x's on them, right? So I want five, six points there. But on the cosecant, the asymptotes are standing in for the other points that you would have found on the sine and cosine. So you, I, you don't need to put that one in. If you want to, you can. You're not going to be wrong, uh, but you don't need to. So then, and we'll pick up with this again tomorrow, guys, but if I'm going to do the secant, the secant is the reciprocal of what? Cosine. So if I look at the cosine function, which kind of looks like that, right, from 0 to 2 pi, same relationships happen. Asymptote, asymptote, maximum, and minimums. And now that black curve would be my secant, okay? Uh, we'll talk about that tomorrow. We'll start class with that tomorrow. And then hopefully maybe spend some time moving these left, right, stretching them, reflecting them, that kind of stuff. Developing the relationships that the reflection of the tangent 
can equate to the cotangent if we mess around with it a little bit, okay? So that's the plan for the next couple days. Um, and then we'll move on. We're, we're slowly, once we, get, once we get an understanding of what these graphs look like, we're going to start solving equations uh, here pretty soon. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of the end result of this. 6-3 is open. Uh, right now I got it set to be due Wednesday night. Um, just kind of start working through it. We'll see where we're at tomorrow after class, uh, whether we need to put more time on that or not.